Uh, welcome to our March 20th go to meeting talking about market builders today I want to start today with a, a quote that I got via email <clears throat> it's really important that you feel good because this feeling good is what goes out as a signal into the universe and starts to attract more of itself to you so the more you can feel good the more you will attract the things that help you feel good and that will keep bringing you up higher and higher that's Dr. Joe Patel motivational author and speaker when you read that what do you think what does this say to you I think today we're going to explore a little bit the idea of attitude and its effect on success and its necessity to success I recently read an article about networking that said we shouldn't for over 20 years every business seminar every sales training program and every even dating and relationship experts have drilled us with the idea that we must network we have to meet to know everybody that touches our industry and then through them reach out to know everybody that touches their industries the author of the article in question disagrees she said that the more important than being a network a networker one should be a connector her points well taken and once made pretty obvious after all what good does it do you to know everyone who is everyone just the knowing isn't enough you have to integrate that knowledge somehow as with many things in life I think the goal here has become overshadowed by the process something that we have to be careful to avoid once we've become familiar with the people in our industry we have to go to the next step to find out their specific needs drives and desires you know for some of our contacts that's easy for others it's more difficult but it may be more rewarding when we know what our contacts need and what they can provide we become the indispensable conduit for the transfer of that information notice that word indispensable something indispensable is something that cannot be ignored business as usual cannot occur unless the indispensable is there a key element to being a market builder is making oneself indispensable you want your customers to fear the day that you leave the industry by connecting the need with the source we make lasting connections that add value to the market by being that connector we facilitate business all along the way adding value to the process through our knowledge of people product and process this role can take many forms we may be the conduit through which information flows from one customer to another <clears throat> think of it this way you know a fabricator you introduce him to an extruder and they form a strong business connection in that scenario we don't see one dime of profit at least not at first but look what's happened the fabricator needs a good extruder good extruder needs customers so we put them together they both benefit the market benefits because there's a new value added to the market through their business relationship we benefit even if neither party buys directly from us how does that work let's say the fabricator benefits from his new relationship with a good extruder to the point that he expands his business and begins building gates of materials other than vinyl now he's building the gate market his customer the gate installer needs hardware to hang gates who's he gonna buy from well if he's connecting with the fabricator he's gonna buy from us and that's just one tiny example of how market building can work in that scenario there's only four players in reality the market in which we work consists of thousands of interconnected players and it only takes one domino to fall the right way to start the whole chain falling our way that's what brings my thoughts to the quote above in order to, in order to understand believe and trust the forces at work in market building we must maintain a positive attitude we don't think something is possible we're not going to take the steps necessary to make it happen I spent over 20 years wanting to finish my college degree and never taking the steps necessary to fulfilling that goal 
After feeling inadequate to the task for so long, I took an experience in the workplace where I encountered a college graduate who was painfully incompetent in every area of life. And I realized that there was no way he should be able to get a degree and I couldn't. Once I had my nose rubbed in it, I signed up for school and graduated four years later. I just needed to believe I was capable. I don't make the mistake of believing the idea that believing is enough. Every sales trainer, guru who tells you to improve your life and your sales by channeling good thoughts or positive energy, well, for every one of those, there's an audience of self-deluded followers who believe that they can control the universe and their destiny by deciding to think about it. Having happy thoughts doesn't add anything to the market. If we bring nothing to the table, can we expect to walk away anything but empty-handed? Some very successful people attribute their success to the fact that they always maintain a good attitude. I'm not trying to say that they're wrong. I'm just saying that there's something else at work here, besides the prerequisite optimism. In order to better understand market builders, I want to explore what that might be. In my case, I had to believe that I could finish school, then demonstrate that belief by signing up and completing the course. If we think back to our earlier sessions, we define success in very personal ways. There was the desire to be financially secure, the desire for respect from one, one's peers, and believe it or not, the desire to have an active and positive outlook on life. Yeah, that sounds like somebody who's been to a sales training seminar. Each of these personal goals shares a social component. None of us would be truly happy and successful if there was not someone else to enjoy it with us or envy us for it. We need to be surrounded by others. That's how we're made. My goal here is to shed a little light on how this principle, properly applied, can take us from where we are to where we want to be. Do you care about people? I'm not referring to some abstract general like. By caring, I mean, does it matter to you that people around you have their needs met? Most people will make an honest assessment and say, yeah, I, I, I care about people. But when it comes down to it, we're usually too wrapped up in our own stuff to pay attention to what others are carrying. Think of the last natural disaster you heard about on TV. First thought is, oh man, how terrible. Those people need help. How do we translate that into action? Add to that the fact that as salespeople, our livelihood is based on making the sale, not on making the guy's life better. That's where we see the disconnect. The average salesperson sees making the customer's life better as just a side benefit to the sale, kind of a value-added proposition. If we're truly market builders, our focus is on making their lives better and making that sale if that's what achieves that purpose. This shift in focus is difficult. We have to put aside our immediate interest making the sale and embrace the best interest of our customer. By connecting the best interests of our customers with our base of product and industry knowledge, by adding our network of contacts, we can connect our customers with the solutions they need to grow their businesses. The old paradigm says we should get a commission on that transaction. The market builder is more interested in building the market, expanding the universe of potential customers by making all who come into contact with him prosper. When that happens, the market builder prospers. Remember, the core of market building is value. By making all the businesses he contacts more prosperous, the market builder maximizes the potential to do more business with each as they expand and grow and seek value to add to their product. Value can take many forms. In its simplest form, value is present when a business deals or when a business deal profits both parties. The purchaser pays only what he's willing for a product, and the seller receives what he's asking for that product. Remember a couple of weeks ago my analogy of buying gas in a bottle of soda at the gas station. I thanked the owner of the gas station, not because I was happy to pay almost four bucks a gallon for gas, but because I received the value I was paying for. There are other forms of value that are less tangible, but no less real. For instance, no one would doubt the value of having a happy, satisfied employees. But how many people do you know that are totally unhappy with their jobs? There's no value to the employer if his employees are unhappy. In fact, disgruntled employees are a net negative to a business. 
Customers can tell when they're dealing with somebody who doesn't believe in what they're doing. Just think of the last time somebody asked you if you wanted fries with that. Was it a sincere question or was he simply following the protocol? Same goes for customers. If we're going to be successful, the first thing we need to do is convince the customer that their experience dealing with us will be far superior to what they experience dealing with our competitor. We must be aware of their needs, present when they need us, anticipate their need, and be able to fulfill their needs. That's a tall order. The only way we're going to hit any of those goals is to know who we're talking to. We need to develop relationships with our customers at least as deep as those we have with our coworkers. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say that if we don't know and understand our customers at least as well as we understand and know our coworkers, then our customers have little reason to trust us with their business. This can be difficult over the phone. Difficult, but not impossible. Some of your customers are experienced enough in dealing with phone salespeople that they will play the game. They understand that your purpose isn't to sell them as much stuff as you can, but to understand their need and try to meet it. These customers will often volunteer information that should be useful to gaining understanding of their needs. This is the stuff to make note of. I had a potential customer who I've been talking to for a couple of months volunteer that he was just getting over poison ivy, which he contracted while clearing land for his new facility. From this, I could tell that he was growing and hiring, needing new help. So I asked him how his job, how his search for new employees was going. He seemed unsurprised that I figured out he was looking for good help. He pointed out that there were a lot of guys in his area already working for other fence companies who were unsatisfied with their situations, and that he, he had just hired one guy and interviewed another. He also volunteered a bit about his philosophy. He told me that he'd rather hire someone who's already working than someone who's been out of work for a while. He's looking for integrity and perseverance. He's looking for value. That's what we should be looking for, too. That's the kind of customer I'm looking for. I want customers who understand value because they will understand why they should be using our products. Now, I'm not likely to ever meet this guy in person unless we run into each other at a conference, but we understand each other well enough to have established a relationship of trust. When he has questions about product or wants to order something, I'm at the top of his list as a go-to person. That's what it means to bring value to the table. I could try to convince my customers to buy from me by cutting my price below that of my competition. All that would accomplish is to run me out of business while making my customers' businesses dependent on inferior products. It's much better for all if we each determine to build our own business by building the markets in which we work. Unfortunately, that's not always the business climate we work in. Today's business emphasis is often short-term. Too many people in the business world, both buyers and sellers, are looking for the lowest price to get out of the transaction and move on as quickly as possible. This idea is premised on the fact that there are so many potential customers out there that even if we don't satisfy them all, there's always someone else to sell. The dangerous thing about this business philosophy is that it works. Look at Bernie Madoff. He made ridiculous promises about his product. He said that his low-priced product would bring back returns equal to or greater than the returns of more traditional investments. He was the quintessential market destroyer. He used flashy sales gimmicks to convince people to buy his cut-rate investments. He used shady accounting tricks to hide what he was doing and diverted current cash flow to pay off previous investors who wanted to cash out. What does that have to do with the fence industry? Well, there's lots of guys who use low price to lure people to buy a cut-rate product. They get away with it as long as new customers are signing up. Cash flow from the new customers goes in part to satisfy the complaints of people who wise up once the contractor leaves and then they realize that they bought junk that needs to be fixed. The problem for both is that sooner or later they've sucked all the value out of the market and there are no new willing victims to buy their shtick. Bernie Madoff went to prison. Fence contractors clo close up shop, or worse, diversify their business and try to destroy another market like landscaping or access control. We need to learn that building markets requires positive attitudes. 
but no amount of happy thoughts will substitute for positive action. The positive action called for is to work hard at becoming indispensable to our customers. And the best way to do that is to have their best interest at the core of everything we do. Don't be a Bernie. Any questions today? I'll take that as yeah, a no. Yeah, I have my mic off, so it took me a minute to get it back on. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. I think you did a great job. Um, and 